Alright, so, so let's chat real quick. So yesterday, we um, ended here hating ourselves with um, Caleb whining about an aneurysm which he doesn't really understand um, because I actually have an aneurysm. So, you do? Yeah, oh my on my God, first. Sorry. It's okay. We've talked about this before. Caleb just apparently doesn't care about it. Yeah. Oh, nice. I'll look him up or I'll just give him a call. Yeah, thanks, dude. Appreciate that. I was telling my wife about that last night. So, we ended up with like Radical 3, 4 over Radical 3, all these really lame, kind of ugly, messy things. But it all started from the point that we had 3x squared plus 8x minus 96 equals 0. And that was our quadratic. And we talked one other time before, um, before we even tried the completing the square method, about one thing that we can actually do in quadratic form that doesn't change the, um, the solution points, but it pretty much changes everything else about the parabola. But if all we care about is the solution points, then we can do this, and it doesn't matter because it doesn't technically change those points. What could we do to this function to make everything easier since our issue is deriving from the fact that A is not 1? Brian? Uh, we, so we tried that yesterday, right? And we can, but it's super ugly and messy because we're going to end up with a solution point of like negative 4 divided by radical 3 over radical 3. Like it's, and actually, we'd have to square root those both sides first and do more manipulation, and it's just bad. So what can we do that doesn't really actually change the solution points? Can you give me a shot? If you have a y divided by 3, you must make it smaller. If a is not 1, make it 1. Because to make a 1, I have to divide everything by 3. But when I look at the right side dividing by 3, does it do anything? No. And actually here, my 96 works well. My 8, not so well, but fractions, especially improper's, are easy to work with in quadratics. So when we get this into our new equation, we get x squared plus keep it as a improper and improper fraction. And 96 divided by 3, 32. So now our process with completing the square was move your constant and then figure out what you would need to make this a perfect square. So I'm going to go ahead, move that constant. How did we figure out what term needs to go here? We said yesterday we should have a formula that C is... Yeah? B over 2 squared. B over 2 squared. So really, though, when I'm working with impro uh, yeah, improper fractions, what does division by 2 actually do? Yeah, you just double your denominator. So this becomes 8 sixths, or we can make it 4 thirds. So you can either just half your numerator or double your denominator. If the improper was messy, that might help you out. So this can become 4 thirds squared which is square the top, square the bottom, 16 ninths. So we add that to both sides. Yes? How do you do it on the calculator, Dr. Young? Uh, he actually just put this, is, he, he just put this in. Yeah. yeah, so it's going to move, what we just did, the division by 3 is going to move our vertex point um, up closer to the x-axis. But the zeros where it goes through the x-axis, those will line up. So my blue parabola um, is probably going to look something like this. And the x-axis would be like here. And my red parabola is going to, sorry, when I start drawing at the same time, it's really tough. It's going to do something like that where it's closer. Because remember, multiplication by 3 is going to like make it more intense. It's going to bring it in towards the y-axis. So my blue is more intense. My red is wider because I've done... Or, sorry, my green parabola, this, is going to actually be what the red line is showing right now. That red parabola. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so what still is... So we'll do the calculator in a second. Let's work the algebra first, and then we'll go to the calculator to check our solutions. So from here, I know that my perfect square has to become that value that we had found, the half b. So it's x plus 4 thirds squared. I can either have it be equal. Um, this is 1 and... What was it? 1 and 7 ninths. So I can make this 33 and 7 ninths, or I can subtract it from both sides. But remember, we're trying to find the zeros, not the vertex. If we were trying to find the vertex, get it to quadratic form, solve that way. But trying to find the zeros, we want to isolate the x. So we are actually going to take the square root of both sides. Um, I'm going to need to capture this. So none of this needs the calculator because it's like, well, we can do it to do our calculations, but if we can do it in our head, we don't need to graph this. We can do it all algebraically. So I captured this up there, so I'm gonna clear this. So we have x plus 4 thirds squared equals 33 and 7 ninths. Because of our square, to start solving for x, we're working order of operations backwards. We gotta get rid of that square root, then get rid of the four thirds. Or, sorry, we gotta get rid of the square with the square root. This becomes x plus four thirds. What's the thing to remember about your square root value? It's in the positive or negative. It is. You're working with length and division to the positive, so you don't have to do complete. Yeah, so my results can be positive or negative but analyze what you're gonna do after you do that. So if I think about plus or positive or negative, that's 5.81187. I know that the next step I'm gonna to take to isolate x will be to subtract 4 thirds. So think which number, the positive value or the negative value will get me an answer that makes sense. Positive minus four thirds will stay positive. So I can actually get rid of the negative option and just subtract four thirds from both sides, which gives me a final x value of 4.478. And that will be in feet. Now I could find another solution value, but it would not make sense. It's like negative seven. Yeah. Negative 7.1452. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I had values correct, so I actually wrote this one out ahead of time. A lot of times I still look at it. So, the calculator method, though. So, Lynn, I'm going to do this in... Uh, actually, I'll do it on my calculator to show you guys the keystrokes and everything. Yeah. So, let's... Do you want to just do the got it and solve it calculator method? Or do you want to solve it algebraically? So let's do, well, we have to derive the quadratic first. So we can't just plug it in until I get my quadratic. Plant a flower garden consists of three square plots surrounded by one foot border. Hey, this sounds the same as the last problem. Area of the garden and the border is 150 feet squared. So the only difference is to start, I set this equal to 150. So we're not doing this problem. We still start with 3x plus 2 and x plus 2 that's going to equal 150. So we still get our 3x squared plus 8x because my outer and my inner make the 8x plus 4 equals 150. Or to make this quadratic, I subtract the 150 from both sides. I guess I'll just stack. And I get 3x squared plus 8x plus, or sorry, minus... 146 equals zero, and we are now quadratic. This is graphable. There's probably a hyphen in there because that sure doesn't look like a word. Graphable.
they probably crashed out of the label. I don't know, but it doesn't look right. So I'm just saying don't trust them. Not on that one. So that then, if I get out my TI. Yeah, in this situation. Now you'll see both. Uh, those are left over from math counts. We're taking them to Columbus State with us. Not right now. I have other ones in my closet if you're curious. You need those. All right. So let's get closer. Good. Use them till they totally die. Yeah. Focus. Uh, yeah, we just wait until they totally die because you can still get a lot of use out of them. That warning is more like, um, hey, go buy some batteries so you're ready. Yeah, but like the new ones are rechargeable. So we had 0x squared plus 8x, but instead of minus 96, we actually have minus 146 this time. Because our quadratic is different this time, because it was area of 150, not area of 100. Cool? Or, yeah. So then I'm looking for the zero points. So do we all have this in our y equal? We want to use this y equal button plug that in. We all good. Three x squared plus eight x minus one forty six. So it's because your window. We, what's your window setting? So we know that this parabola has shifted down 146 units. And I'm actually at the same time, I'm going to do something really quick. 146 divided by 3. 48 and two-thirds. So if I want to graph the parabola with the three factored out, that would be x squared plus eight-thirds x. Why did you back it out again? I, I just want to show you both of these. Minus, um, sorry, what was that? 48 and two-thirds. Um, I'll just make this easy and put it in as a rational, and my calculator will do the work for me. So you don't have to have the y2 there. I just want you to see both parabolas. I'm now going to set my window to something that's probably going to manage these. If I have a, a y min that's going to actually have to ship down 146, I'm going to make this, I don't know, 160, something like that. My max doesn't really matter because I just need to see the x-axis to so make sure it's big enough to get it. So if I make this 400, my gap between them is 200, and then I can make my scale 20, which is nice, because your string likes to divide by 10. My x's, we're not quite certain what it's going to be, but the area is going to be bigger than it was before. So my x max is pretty much guaranteed to be too big with that. So if I make it 10, let's see how that goes. It, that doesn't always work as well. It sometimes makes it it sometimes tries to fit way too much of the parabola because it doesn't know what you're doing. So we know we're trying to find our zeros. So now when I go to graph this, which I just hit graph, notice there's my y1, there's my y2. So the only difference that factoring out that 3 makes is it changes the steepness or the intensity of that parabola. We now, please give me your attention for a moment up here. We now want to find the zero points where it crosses that x-axis and that x-axis. So I use second calc and I hit zero because I'm looking for the zero. Well, okay, yeah, I select zero or I hit two. 
Now, notice at the top of your screen, it tells you what function you're looking at or what function you're on. If I want to switch functions, I can hit the up or down arrow and it will switch to my other function. Either of these are going to have the same zeros. And since I only care about the positive, I can go to the positive and drop my left bound somewhere on the left side of the intersection, drop my right bound somewhere on the right of the intersection, and try to guess as close as possible. What is the point of guessing? Uh, it centers. So your calculator uses the left bound, right bound, and a guess to say, start here on this side, there on this side, and work your way towards this point. And if it's a zero, does it automatically kind of lead towards like either a blank or zero? What? It knows what you're trying to do. Okay. It's going to plug in X's till it gets the output of Y and Z. Yeah, so it's going to say it's going to zero. And really, it solves it. It just algebraically solves it. Just that quick, though. Questions on this? Anyone need help in the calculator? So now my bigger garden is apparently going to measure approximately 5.8 feet by 5.8 feet each square plot. 5.77 if you want to be more specific. If you did not get something close to that, it's probably because your window is way too like off. If your window is huge, your X values are a bigger jump. Every pixel on your screen represents more value. So that's a bad idea. So, like, if I want to get really specific, not nah, excuse me. If I want to get really specific here, I know my x is between five and six. So, what if I go to my window? Sorry, let's take this out. If I go to window and I make my x min instead, let's make this four and let's make that seven, yeah. and let's only look at that range. But then my y's don't need to be very big either. So I can just make this like I don't know negative ten to positive ten, and make sure that your y scale is not bigger than your actual thing. So now I'm just going to see those intersection points. Yeah, we could do that as well. Once you get familiar with window changing, I kind of want you guys to practice setting your own windows because your failure at that will help teach you like, oh, wait, I needed to, whatever. So now if I do my zero, where's 5.5? 5.5 .5 would be to the left of my point. Oh, so there I am. So now I'm really, really close with my left bound and my right bound. So I drop my left, bump up to my right, and then do my guess. I was already really close the first time. So there's not much more precision that we can get. Any questions? Each of those gardens, just to play with this, would be... 5.77 squared, right? Because they're squares. Then there's three of them. So the, that's the area of your garden. And then the walkway, now, if we look at how much area is going to be involved in here, just, actually this gets really fun. This is like a math counts type problem. From here to here is the same up here. And then from there to there, 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 the, what, what are these corners? What area would those corners each have? One. So we've got one, two, three, four. Then I can calculate each of these by saying, well, if it's 5.77 times one, 5.77 times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those. So what's 5.77 times eight? 46.1. And then if you add those four corners, so plus, hold on, 5.77 times, sorry, we said eight, and then plus the four corners, there's the area of my garden. Well, the, the garden and the borders and everything that we, that, so the problem started us, the area is approximately 150. There's our area. And we rounded off some of those decimals, so that's where some of our rounding mistakes could come in. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say? No, I was going to say, can we just find the area of the walkway by subtracting the number of dots that are individually? Well, but you were using that, that would be a something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have to check if you were yep. I was just trying to get us to the area, proving that if I plug in that X, it works. 
So, any other questions on the completing the square process? What I really want you guys to see is don't try it if your A is not 1. Make your A1, whatever improperties you have to use, doesn't matter, make A1 if you're going to use completing the square. What if you see you have something that doesn't match? But if, like, if it asked you on the error test, say, like, in the box shown to the right, show the process of completing the square to find the zeros of this, uh, of this quadratic. Then you have to show the process. Well, you Otherwise, you, you get zero. Point. I don't know. That's the problem. We, we don't know the test. Yes. You will. So, you would have a graphing calculator to be able to check your answer once you would write out that process. Whopper. I was going to say, did you show us how to do that because you weren't here two days ago? So, uh, so I had a video of it. I watched that. If you're still confused, then come see me. Because it's just kind of a, a bigger process. Okay. You can skip through the video, whatever the case works right. for you. But it's in the chapter 12 folder. All right. Carmen, you had your hand up. Questions about completing the square. We'll get to the homework in a second. Well, I was going to ask um, if, um, like, So, I talked to a couple eighth grade teachers, and they essentially told me to tell you guys to chill out on the whole high school scheduling thing. You do not need to decide anytime soon. They would like you to get a bit more information from the high schools before we start, like, talking and trying to make those decisions. So I'm going to respect that request, and today at least, not, um, I'm not going to talk about that. Oh. So if you have individual questions, then we, we can chat, but we're not going to have like a big old group, like here's what you should do, because you guys should really find out some more information, and then think more on your own before anybody slays your decision. I'd like to check our homeworks and take questions, because I know there's some questions on homework. So if you would please get out your chapter 12 homework that you have up to this point. I don't think you gave me the notes yesterday. Four or five? Uh, six is completing the square. Sorry, is that what you need? Of like giving out time. This is like if kids are dying, they need it for class. And after this, we're heading to lunch. So it's not like you're in class for a long, long time. 12 6. How many people need 12 6? Caleb, you need it. Brian, you need it. Traveler, do you have 12 6? Brian and Caleb was on it. Brian, will you go, or Caleb, will you go to the library of black and white printer? All right, so in 12.1, we were finding the vertex. We were talking about minimums, maximums, all those fun things. Graphing it, just make sure that you understand how to graph it. You would make a little T-chart and just get five points for your graph, one of which you normally want to be your vertex. We know here only the intensity and the direction has changed. It is not shifted at all. Any questions from the front? All right, moving to the back. When we talk about doing this, especially now that we know how to graph it in our calculator, we can use graphing utilities to help us with that. Back to 12 one. Domain is your x values, range is your y values. They're alphabetical. 
x, y, x before y, d before r. Any questions? Control point whatsoever. Twelve two. Anything one through like this is twelve two. The yeah. quadratic functions. So because you know that there is no B term, you know that just the intensity has changed and it's been shifted up by one. So it has not shifted left or right because it's difference of squares, the B term does not exist. So it has not had a horizontal shift. Yeah, horizontal shift, well when you factor it out, but that would be if it's a perfect square and then there's like a plus or a minus happening on the outside of it. Difference of square, this would end up being <clears throat> um, like square root of three x plus one, square root of three x minus one. Or, no, we have to do a little bit other tweaking with that. But really what they're trying to get you to see is it has not shifted left to right, so the axis stays in the same place. The only the only shift was the plus one. This changed intensity. On to seven to ten. Two seven to eleven. Moving on. Anything from the front? On the back. How long will it take for the ball to reach the maximum height? How long? So, if I know, so here's the problem. So the small hill part is the interesting thing. So I'm actually going to graph this to help <clears throat> understand it. So I'm going to put this up on the TV for a second. So if I put that function in here, so at negative 16t, which is our, or sorry, t squared, which is our gravity, uh, plus 50t, which is our upward velocity, and our plus 10 is that we started 10 feet up because we're on a hill. Now I'm going to assume that they're talking about the ground as in zero, because when we talk about ground level, that's normally a, a zero. So I need to think about, well, what window is going to make sense? Well, we're talking about golf. My ball is not going to go negative unless I hit it into water, which there's nothing in here about that. And it's probably not going to stay in the air for, you know, minutes at a time. So when I think about my window, I can say, well, my X min, I just want to see the Y axis. So I'm going to make it like negative five just so I can see the axis. This is time, remember, X is your time. So I'm going to make it, I don't know, 30, it might maybe, if it's magical, stay in the air for 30 seconds. Make that y scale 5, just because that distance between is divisible by 5. My y min, it's not going to go negative, so I'm just going to make that like negative 5, just so I can see the axis. It could probably go pretty high, so I'll make my y min, or sorry, my y max, I don't know, 75 if I'm just guessing. Obviously, I could look at the answers that we have, but if I was guessing, I'd make it something like that. And then maybe 5 or 10 or some kind of scale. Let's do 10, because the distance between is 80. If I go to graph it now, you see the ball starts, woo! So my time is way off. So I go back to my window and say, well, how far is that first tick mark? 
pull off my window is a scale of five. I know, I don't need much in the X scale, so let's try this again. There's a better graph. I can do even better. I'm just trying to get you guys used to messing with the graph a little bit. Let's do two and five, and then make this scale one. That seems better. So, I start 10 feet up. I arc up to where my axis of symmetry is, tells me the maximum height of the ball, and then I end up here. So when we solve this, trying to find the max height, how do we do that? Because we talked about making t-charts first, right? Like yeah. plugging in x values. Did you get a calculator with us? So I can't, if I have the calculator, I can make a table. So I would want to go to my table set and make sure that I start somewhere. Well, actually, it won't matter where I start if they make me start. They make me have a number there. So if I just start at zero, that's fine. But I want this to be ask. And once I turn it to ask, my start shouldn't really matter because I'm filling in all my x values. So when x is 1 or 2 or 3 or 4, and I see, oh, wow, okay. So there has been a maximum height somewhere either between 1 and 2 or 2 and 3. So then I can get more specific. So after 1, I can do 1.5, still going up, 1.7. Ooh, now I came back down. So it's between 1.5 and 1.7, and I can kind of keep working that process. Oh, that's your solution point. So that's where y is zero. Because when it hits the ground, that's this right here. No, y is zero. X is the amount of time the ball has been traveling. So when your height is zero, so when you set that function equal to zero, that's, I mean, we can either solve it algebraically, we can um, put it in the graph, we can literally plug in x's till I figure it out. So I could keep, if I was using a, a utility and I'm just trying, this is negative, so I've gone too far. So what about three? Okay, we're still going down, 3.1, 3.2, we're getting closer, 3.3, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3
like that had won or lost races for people. All right, go back. So short answer here, easiest thing to do is put it in the graph and use the zero function. Okay. But there's just lots of other ways you can also do it. Which is the Caleb method. Any questions from 12th grade? Carmen, did you have one? No, no, no. The, I, it was the 17th. 17th was the I don't think it's fine. All right, 12th grade. They told me you guys are on normal schedule until you hit the AO time and then you'll miss AO. Yeah, internet speeds don't have AO. Don't have AO. We have AO. We need to keep going so they think that our participating yeah. 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 are missing. I thought we were supposed to be in the same time. It's not like they take a whole party or something. Hey, I mean, you'll be okay. Yeah, I think you'll be okay. Oh, I don't know. Let me see if I can get a hold of this guy. All right, poll three. I'm going to try to call Miss Collins, 12 3. Modeling. I mean, if you're worried, I don't care. You guys can go now. We'll pick for a couple minutes. Oh, yeah, well, so not everyone. Like, International Feast. Yeah. Uh, second. Bye, Brian. Bye, Caleb. 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 Bye, Ca